I guess I want to say that this talk is going to be focused on some computational details of these sort of papers on entanglement islands and the page curve that uh, people have been working on since uh, last year. And I'm doing this because you know, there's a lot of talks online now and much of sort of the big picture stuff uh, has been already been said by various people, uh, including, you know, this IS workshop in December and this KITP quantum gravity 20 workshop. And there's also like an ongoing ICTP school. So I wanted to sort of make this a little bit different than, you know, just saying the punchlines again and maybe focusing on a little bit more of the details of the setups of the calculation and actually doing some simple computations to see how these uh, islands arise and so on. And I will mainly be talking about some models that we discussed in a paper with Ahmed and Juan uh, about some eternal black holes and uh, equilibrium situations where some entropy paradoxes show up. So yeah, so please take it in that, uh, in that spirit. Okay, so a big role in this talk will be played by these so-called quantum extremal surfaces, a notion which was uh, first defined by Engelhardt and Wall, extending the Ryutakyanagi and HRT and uh, these kinds of formulas. Okay, so we want to, uh, just to set the stage, uh, talk about this entanglement entropy uh, in gauge gravity duality. So I've drawn here like ADS D plus one, so throughout this talk, little d will be the space-time dimension of the CFT. And this b uh, is a sub-region of the quantum mechanical theory. So uh, the CFT lives on the circle that is drawn here. And the red b is a, is a sub-region. And a is some co-dimension to surface in the gravity region. So right now it's the candidate region. And the question we are trying to ask is that there should be so ADS CFT is not just that the entire CFT is dual to the entire ADS. There is a finer structure to it. Like subregions on the boundary are dual to subregions in the bulk. So there is some kind of finer duality. And the question is, what is the region in ADS which is dual to this subregion B? Okay, so the, the answer to that question is you pick uh, such a candidate A surface in the bulk, which ends on the boundaries of B and uh, the generalized entropy is, you define this quantity, generalized entropy, which is a function of this surface, capital A, as the area divided by G Newton plus uh, the bulk entropy of the matter fields in this hatched region. So the A and B enclose a spatial region in the bulk, and it's the bulk entropy of the matter fields on that, in that hatched region. And the claim of Engelhardt and Wall, generalizing that of uh, HRT and FLM is that one should take this functional S gen of A uh, and sir? yes. Uh, sir. Is there a question? I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. In the, uh, is my voice audible? Yes. Uh, so is this formula of uh, generalized entropy? We are considering the area and the uh, bulk term. Uh, so is there any constraint on the bulk entanglement entropy or it can be arbitrarily precise? Uh, I'm saying so because uh, uh, as bulk, uh, do we, meaning it can be a UV divergent quantity and uh, I really don't know what it means that we can normalize it by the Newton's constant. Okay, I'll address some of these questions as we go along, but really you should, you know, we, like let's, in the examples, it will become clear what this S bulk is, if it's not clear okay. right now. And I will comment on this UV divergence issue in a bit. Thanks. But right now you should just think of it as sort of a, sort of a heuristic formula if, if you want. Uh, right, and the spirit of, okay. of this whole work is to sort of get to something interesting and then sort of analyze, you know, where we land and sort of, you know, some of these sort of technical subtleties are, are indeed sort of swept under the rug, but I'll comment on some of these things as we go along. Uh, so is this formula true to arbitrary orders in the Newton or we need to consider the semi-classical limit? Uh, 
let's be in the semi-classical limit to be sure. So there will be this S bulk will be the entropy of some CFT with a large but not too large central charge. Uh, and, so, uh, I mean, the purpose of this talk the... is not to sort of is not to sort of get into the nitty gritties of this formula and there are subtleties in the derivation, but there's clearly something right about this. So, we're just going to follow our nose and see where we land. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, the claim of Engelhardt and Wall that generalizes the HRT is that you're supposed to take this generalized entropy functional and minimize that. So don't just minimize the area. And the minimization gives you the entanglement entropy of the boundary region B. And the minimizing surface denoted by A star is, is the so-called quantum extremal surface for B. And this is not just a statement about a numerical number for the entropy, but the claim also is that the gravity subregion, which is dual to the B on the boundary, is the bulk region between A star and B. So finding this A star is clearly uh, something of interest because it tells you both what subregion is dual to B in the bulk and it also tells you the entropy of the B region. Okay, so I have a remark here about the UV finiteness of S gen. So as was already pointed out, like S bulk in a QFT is usually UV divergent. Now, there, is, there are claims which have been sort of check to various degrees of precision, but I don't think it's watertight, is that the G-Newton also receives one loop UV divergent contribution. And those two things are supposed to cancel. Okay, so that's one uh, statement that in gravity, this combination is actually finite. There uh, is another I, I have a question, yes. actually, if you don't mind. Yes, uh, yes, yes. So yes. This, this formula of uh, Engelhardt and Wall, uh, yeah. Will it receive uh, corrections in G Newton, like order G Newton square, et cetera, et cetera, in principle? Or... Yes, I think so, in principle, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Mm -hmm. But you see, some of that is already included because uh, we are minimizing, you know, the com combined functional. Because you see, the G Newton is here, so it's not just that. Uh, you know, it's not just a tree level plus one loop after you minimize. Before it looks like that, but you know, you also find this A star and plug it back in. So it contains some kind of perturbative corrections, but we will always be in a limit where just the one loop term is the most important thing. Uh, so are you going to say uh, something Raghu, about this maximum prescription of, you know, extremizing on a Cauchy slice and then taking the minimum on Cauchy slices or? Uh, no, so but that maximum you, yeah. will be, imposed by symmetry in all the examples I consider. Okay. Uh, so I will just be minimizing and then the maxima in time is sort of just the usual case how um, maybe there are subtleties that, that you know of, but uh, I'm just thinking of the bifurcation surface in the eternal black hole geometry. You naively just minimize the area and it's, it's maximized in time sort of right automatically by the okay. symmetry. Okay. Yeah, so Raghu, since we are on the uh, yeah. this topic, uh, I know there are these some there have been some discussions about this thing uh, about balancing the tree level and one loop. Uh, so uh, and in some sense, there is some way in which you can believe that there is suppression of the higher loops, even though you apparently seem to be balancing two different things at uh, in G Newton. So, but do you want to comment on that? Uh, um, um, well, uh, I think maybe we'll come to that when we look at the act some formulas for, for, for S bulk, and maybe that would be a better point to discuss this, but I'm happy to do that sure. in a uh, bit. Sure, we, uh, uh, we can talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, one comment that I wanted to make about the UV finiteness of this quantity is that if you really believe that the, the sum at the minimum is computing the von Neumann entropy of B, then the only, we know from the field theory analysis that the only divergences in the von Neumann entropy come from the boundaries of B, right, near these tips. And those are already included in the infrared divergences in ADS. So because the surface A goes all the way to the boundary, there is that divergence. So we shouldn't expect uh, 
you know, it's self-consistent that these kind of matter loops running around this boundary little a don't give you extra divergences, which was the statement of the one loop piece of G Newton and S pulse sort of canceling. Because th there is no room in the boundary to accommodate those divergences. Uh, right. Okay, so, but I, I don't think that said, I don't think this is completely well settled, uh, this, uh, this question of this being finite, um, this, this combination being finite. Okay, and here, uh, there is also a subtlety associated to graviton contributions to the one loop term. Uh, so these are not, again, well understood. And so the, the out that people take is that uh, we take the bulk matter to have a large number of degrees of freedom. So, so you know, there's a one over G Newton, and then there's some central charge C. And we take that large, so the contribution to S bulk from those C number of matter fields overwhelms the graviton contribution. So therefore, the graviton contributions can be ignored. I mean, this is not the real world setup, but uh, in this toy model, it's enough to sort of set up an information paradox and sort of see how, how it gets uh, resolved, quote unquote. Uh, okay. Hello? Yeah. yeah Hi, so, Logan. So would you say yeah. the, you know, like if you had a Maxwell field in the bulk, the corresponding contributions are under, better understood? Or, or is there similar? Yes, use? yes. Uh, yeah, I would say, yeah, th those are sort of one step closer to being better understood because you see there is some kind of playoff because if you have a graviton contribution, this area also changes, right? So, so there is some contribution because sort of the area itself has some fluctuations. So how you partition the graviton term between these two is what is not clear to me, at least. Mm -hmm. In the Maxwell field, it's, it's clear that it's going to go into the s bulk term. So. Okay. But uh, if the uh, worry is about factorization of Hilbert space and so on and so forth, then uh, the gauge field also. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, that is at the heart of the issue. But I think there's an additional thing, where, which is that this leading the area piece is also sort of, you know, built out of the metric fields and, you know, how you should, whether you should think of the bulk graviton term as S bulk or as some renormalization, a small renormalization of the area or something like that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay, but, you know, if you are in, let's say a 4D theory of gravity, this computing this S bulk is sort of, you know, impossible. Okay. We don't know uh, how to compute it. Even uh, let's say 3D free scalar field, we have no idea. Uh, okay, so, so you might think this angle hard wall formula is, is nice to look at, but it's sort of basically useless. How are you going to extremize it? Well, there are some scenarios in which we can make some progress. And basically, if you take a two dimensional theory of gravity, and you take the bulk matter to be a CFT, then you can use the Cardi Calabresi expressions for a CFT2 entropy. And this was already done in a paper in 94 by a Fiola, Preskill, Strominger, and Trivedi, in which, in the context of the CGHS model, they had the CGHS black hole coupled to n matter fields. And they were analyzing the entanglement entropies in that setup. And then more recently, this paper of Almeri, Engelhardt, Maralt, and Maxfield analyzed this uh, model in, in the ADS-JC gravity. And we will discuss sort of a second scenario later if we get to it. But so now we are going to just focus on this uh, two-dimensional case. Okay, so now I'm going to discuss these simple examples from our paper with Ahmed uh, and Juan from October. Okay, so this ADS2 JT gravity, I'm sure all of you are sick of it by now looking at this action. So we have two fields, this dilaton and the metric. There is this action phi times r plus two, which sets this Ricci scalar to negative two. And there's a boundary term, which has a Gibbons Hawking term and a holographic counter term. I just want to say a few things about dimensions. Epsilon is a UV cutoff, which has dimensions of length. And phi r should be thought of as a dimensional full coupling constant, which also has dimensions of length. So phi r appears here 
as sort of the boundary value of the dilaton is phi r over epsilon. Uh, okay, and the G Newton is dimensionless in, in 2D. So phi r is really the dimensionful uh, number in this Lagrangian. Okay, and the boundary conditions are that the TT component of the metric should be big, should be one over epsilon squared, and the dilaton at the boundary should be this phi r over epsilon, which is dimensionless. So phi itself is dimensionless. Okay, so uh, just a couple of comments. We are in two bulk dimensions, so co-dimension two surfaces are just a point, or perhaps a collection of points. So it's not some some you know dimension one or dimension two whose area we can compute. So what do we mean by area? Area we just mean the value of the dilaton at that point. So if A is a candidate quantum extremal surface, which is just a single point, the meaning of the area is the dilaton at that point because uh, the dilaton is sort of what multiplies uh, the, the two-dimensional Ricci scalar. And even in higher dimensions, we get area in Gibbons Hawking because it's air, sort of, you know, D minus two-dimensional area times the two-dimensional Ricci scalar. So, uh, okay. And from now on, we will just set 4G Newton to one. So, so this, this uh, area over four piece will just be equal to the value of the dilaton. Uh, but the dilaton is varying from place to place, so it depends on where we are. So here is a simple solution for the dilaton and the metric discussed in this paper by Maldasena, of Stanford and Yang. So we have uh, the metric, which is Poincaré ADS2. We are going to work with this, so we have a zero temperature ADS2. And the dilaton profile is phi r over negative x. I, I put a minus here because I, I'm going to take x to be positive in this figure to the right. So in the ADS region, this triangle X is negative. So, so that's why I put a phi R over minus X here. And we've defined sort of these conventional light cone coordinates, T plus X and T minus X. So if we want to satisfy uh, the boundary, con uh, yes. Uh, Raghu, there is a question in the chat box. So you want to address it now? So Malai Pandey is asking, how do we fix the boundary condition for the dilaton? What, uh, the boundary condition for the dilaton is part of the definition of the problem. So the, the, it's like a Dirichlet boundary condition for the dilaton. It has to be equal to this phi r over epsilon. Does that make sense? Uh, why are we fixing it to be phi r over epsilon? Well, that's just oh. a choice. I mean, you have something else in mind or? I mean, there are other uh, boundary conditions you can put, pick, I mean, but this is just one choice that gives a well-defined problem. Well, meaning uh, uh, we want uh, the dilaton to be constant at the boundary. Is that, um, why do we need the yeah. dilaton to vary as one by L? You, you don't put, you don't have to put it to be constant. And in fact, in this paper of Malda, Sena, Stanford and Yang, they do allow for a general phi r, which depends on the time parameter on the boundary. Uh, meaning so I'm worried about case. the... Uh -huh. I'm worried about the variation of uh, dilaton with the length scale. Could it be epsilon square or some other power? Well, it could be, but it would give you maybe a trivial theory. Like, uh, the point is that uh, here, the k minus one goes as epsilon squared if you compute it. So the square root of gamma already has a one over epsilon. So okay. you see, you need a one over epsilon with the dilaton to cancel that epsilon squared if your boundary is sort of far out in ADS. Okay. So, so to see what I'm saying, this is one over epsilon, yeah. this is one over epsilon and this thing is epsilon squared. So you get some finite uh, boundary action. Yeah. Uh, okay, so here is our solution and here is sort of the dilaton profile. Okay, and we have introduced these light cone coordinates. And we know sort of the dual, roughly speaking, is supposed to be this SYK sort of quantum dot. It's a collection of n fermions moving in time. So this is the dual description. And the boundary conditions are satisfied at x equals negative epsilon. So this green curve is where we should put the holographic cutoff in ADS2. Okay, 
So now we want to couple in some CFT, and there is a we we add this action ICFT of some matter field chi coupled to the metric G, and we don't couple it to the dilaton. That's again a choice. Okay, so now we just before we dive into computing uh, generalized entropy functionals and so on, we need to review these uh, formulas in a CFT two, the entanglement entropy formula. So if we have a space-like line segment AB, Cardi and Calabrese, they told us that the entanglement entropy is C over three times log of L over the UV cutoff. I'm just gonna re-express it as a C over six and put an L squared, but then use the fact, uh, use Lorentz invariance to write L squared as the invariant interval, delta X plus, delta X minus. If it's just some space like, you know, if A and B are points which are space-like separated, and in the next step, I have just separated out the X plus contribution and the X minus contribution. Okay, and then I have also sort of now introduced this omega. So where this omega comes from is because in general, we will want to put our CFT not on flat space, but on a general two dimensional space, which has this vial factor, omega, one over omega squared. So if we want the physical cutoff to be constant, then the coordinate cutoffs in X plus and X minus should be omega times a fixed parameter, right? So the cutoffs that we should put should depend on omega. And these minus signs give crucial minus C over six log omega terms are crucial for correct uh, computations of the entropy. Another way to think about this omega dependence is that we compute the entanglement entropies by inserting twist operators and by computing the correlation function of twist operators. And in the presence of uh, vial factors, the correlation functions depend on that vial factor by powers omega to the dimension of the operator. Okay, so here is some, some formula for the entanglement entropy that we're going to use multiple times. There's the coordinate dependence and uh, some dependence on the vial factor. Okay, uh, are there any questions about this? Yeah, I have a question. So what are A and yes, B? Uh, a and B were the endpoints of the interval whose entropy we are computing. And so when you say omega of A, that means what exactly? The omega so it's, at the... It's the ve omega at the point A, yeah, exactly. And omega at the point B. So because the twist operators are inserted at the points, right? The twist operators are locally inserted on the endpoints of the interval. So the correlation function of the twist operators picks up the vial factors at the insertion points. So these are not translation invariant contributions. These are some local contributions from the endpoints. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you. Uh, Sorry? That, okay. Yes. Yeah, how to fix the uh, vial factor? So the vial factor is fixed basically in this problem because we have ADS2. So this X squared is equal to omega squared. Right, so we just have some, some curved space which has some omega. And every 2D metric can be put in a conformally flat form. So how about the generic uh, two dimensional, for example, JT like gravity, how to fix a vial factor? Is, uh, is there similar logic? Well, uh, it in general depends on the theory you are trying to solve and the state you are trying to consider. I mean, it's not some fixed thing. It depends on a case-to-case -case which situation you're considering. Okay, thanks. Like in CGHS, it will be something. In the black hole, it will be something else and so on. So. Okay, thanks. So the, the formula for the entropy, yeah. so that's yeah. for the entropy for the vacuum state. On yeah, yeah for the vacuum state. So on a flat on, space, but on this curved background, on this background with omega. Hold on, S A B, the Cardi's for, Cardi um, calibration formula. That's for the vacuum on C F T vacuum yeah. on the Minkowski space, Euclidean. Right, that's this now, line. That's this right. Right. So now, what would that correspond to the what state? would that correspond to the uh, in ADS? Because you'll have to do a conformal transformation. So what is the state that you're considering in the bulk now? 
Well, it will be the the Poincaré vacuum in ADS, right? Because uh, this omega is equal to x. So again, this will depend on a case-to-case -case basis. But when omega is x, the inhomogeneous term in the stress tensor is zero. The the yeah. So so when you transform, when you put in this file factor and you consider the transformation of the state, the stress tensor sort of picks up a term which is like omega double prime over omega proportional to the central charge. But since omega is just linear in the coordinate, this term is zero. So for this particular case, you're just going to have the usual Poincaré vacuum in ADS2. Gotcha, thanks. Okay. So if you had uh, generalized the length yeah. itself as integral of the metric along the line, you would get the same uh -huh. formula or this is a different formula? Uh, I think it will be different in general. Right, right. I think it will be different. Uh, it, and this is, right, right. And yeah, that's an important point because the state we are considering, so this formula is really derived by making the conformal transformation to the flat space and mapping the state that way. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, okay, so now let's compute an entanglement wedge. Uh, so in this case, you know, in the zero temperature ADS2, the boundary is just a single spatial point. So we can only compute the entanglement wedge of the entire boundary, right? that there is no subregion, at least geometrically, there is no subregion. So we had better find that the entanglement wedge is the entire Poincaré patch, right? Otherwise, we're just some doing something silly. Okay, but now, before we do that computation, we should remember that the CFT we are considering here is on a space with a boundary, like there is a strip. So the left movers and right movers are not really independent degrees of freedom. So we are not going to get an independent log of delta x plus and a log of delta x minus contribution. We're just going to get one, one of those. And th this can be, this is sort of, I said it in words, but one can justify it using BCFT sort of cardi doing cardi calabresi in a BCFT. Okay, so now let's try to do this. So let's consider a candidate quantum extremal surface A, and we and uh, this has to, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, delta, why is it that delta x plus and delta x minus are not independent for uh, reflecting boundary conditions? I mean, think uh, of the case, uh, like if you have a particle moving this way at the this is sort of a right moving particle so it's like a function of x minus its wave function but then it gets reflected okay. and it becomes a function of x plus right so uh, that's why uh, so we so have some it, kind of reflect yeah, yeah but uh, shouldn't we include it in the entanglement entropy term though we know what delta x minus is as a function of delta x plus well, I tried to give an intuitive uh, reasoning here, but it, it, it might not like satisfy everyone and that's fair, but then the way to do that computation would be to set up the replica trick in a BCFT and go yeah, through yeah. the steps of Cardi Calabrese and you will find this answer. Okay. So basically instead of getting C over three times log L, you get a half, half of that answer. Uh, okay. So, so let's just try to compute it. So, so A is a candidate quantum extremal surface and we have to compute the generalized entropy of this green line. That's the analog of the hashed region that we had before. So here are the light cone coordinates. So remember that plus direction goes this way and the minus direction goes this way. And the point B is at the origin and the point A has coordinates X and minus X uh, just because the time is zero. So T plus X is X and t minus x is minus x. Uh, these are x plus x minus coordinates of these two points. Okay, so the generalized entropy is equal to the area over four term. Remember, area was just the dilaton, but the dilaton, it has this form. It's just phi r over minus x. Then we have a contribution from the coordinate, but we only have one contribution instead of the two because of this boundary effect. And then we have a vial factor at A, so omega of A. At B, well, we can put the omega of B, but it doesn't depend on A. 
and we are going to extremize x so it doesn't matter like we can leave that out so so what do we get because omega of a is just minus x right uh, it's minus x because x is negative there that's all so so these two terms actually just cancel each other okay and you're left with the generalized entropy as a function of x being phi r over negative x and of course this is minimized at x equals minus infinity which is sort of all the way to the poincare horizon so the a star sort of lives all the way here and we find that the entanglement wedge of b is the entire poincare patch which is sort of good and intuitively correct and everything is good um okay so let me stop here for more questions and this is, just gives you zero right i mean uh, it's true uh the entropy will be well you see i like to think of these formula as giving the entanglement wedge robustly like because we are just minimizing but we know the entropy must be zero because it's the entire system but you see we drop some infinite constants along the way and like for example this omega of b and some uv cutoffs and then i have to appeal to this renormalization of g newton thing to actually say that this is the full answer for the entropy and when i plug in the minimal thing x equals minus infinity i actually get zero okay but there are all these caveats hidden about you know canceling some of these constant uv divergent terms but we should always be careful to include the x dependent or the a dependent things in our formulas okay yeah but but you're right so the entropy is indeed uh, zero as we plug in here and we find zero uh is it true that okay. in general the uv divergent terms will also affect the extremal surface itself I mean, if you uh, don't assume that they cancel, then eventually they will enter the extremal surface also, right? You mean? Uh, sorry, let me try to understand. So we will have some general expression for S gen, which will be yeah. a functional of where the A is. Yes. Uh, but the structure of the UV divergence will be sort of local along the the A stretches. Let's say it's a one-dimensional thing, like in my first figure. then the uv divergences are some local things all along a right that's right yes so so then what people would say is that all those things are sort of cancelled by counter terms local counter terms that also renormalize g newton on the surface so so there is no like sort of long distance dependence on the shape of a like it doesn't depend on sort of if a has a very big long wavelength wiggle then there shouldn't be a uv divergence that depends on that that shape but if we are trying to can, i mean its extremization involves both the classical piece and the quantum piece right yes uh -huh. so i mean you have to assume something there uh, to say that it's independent of the uv cutoff the extremal surface right because it it could cancel and leave a finite term for example which will change the extremal surface also oh 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 i see um right right okay okay i see yeah yeah you're worrying about some sort of so for example the area getting modified by the this uv renormalization so if we do some renormalization we might find that uh the the g newton has changed by some constant factor for example right yeah yeah right 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 so you we would have to take all those things into account in a full uh calculation but you see here is where the trick of assuming that the c is large comes in because in in this limit uh, we can sort of you know reliably just trust the the tree level dilaton expression without having to uh, back react it at that uh, level so yeah in if there was just some order one number of fields then then it would be what you're saying would be correct but i yeah. think in if, this if regime of it didn't cancel see you have this quantum pieces have cancelled out right yeah if they didn't cancel mm -hmm. then the uv divergence there could affect the extremal surface also right uh so we are going to discuss an example in which these two terms don't cancel in a minute and then maybe 
okay. it will be clear uh, what 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 I what I want to say. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, Rahul, shouldn't this uh, particular result be extremely robust in that you know uh, one should say if one has any renormalization procedure so that a kind of decreases towards the horizon, and presumably you know s uh, bulk also decreases, and so there's some. You know, presumably any renormalization procedure should give you this at least this result should be very robust. I would imagine that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. For, uh, for this case, yes. For this case, yes. I agree. Um, but what I'm going to say, uh, let me just discuss the next case and then, then it will become, I think maybe the discussion will be more uh, uh, like cohesive at that point. Um, give, give me just two minutes. Okay, so we found this nice uh, result. Now, next we are going to couple our quantum mechanical system, uh, this quantum dot, this SYK quantum dot to a wire, to a one dimensional wire. So one should just think of it as just, you know, coupling it you have some interesting system and you're probing it with some other, other quantum mechanical system in the lab. And the motivation comes from trying to make a large ADS black hole evaporate. So if this was not SYK, this was some N equal to four super Yang mills you simulated in your lab, you know, you could try to just wick away energy from it um, uh, using some auxiliary system, okay? And here there are also going to be some leaps of faith in what the holographic duals of such systems is and so on. But uh, again, the spirit is to sort of follow your nose and you land on something interesting and then all the subtleties can sort of be discussed uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, okay, so, so we have a holographic, you know, the quantum mechanical system and we couple it to a wire. And so a natural guess for this gravity dual of the system is that this SYK you know, it's still dual to some ADS space, but now we just glue that ADS onto flat space. So on the left, we have a region of ADS2, and on the right, we just couple it to some flat space. And here is the dual. So there's the SYK, there's the wire. Uh, I have a question. Time. Uh, I have a, yes, com I have a com comment. Uh, yeah. so just one sentence that the SYK model is not uh, conformally invariant, in fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. So, so, so there, there, there's an issue here about this modeling. So, if you want to uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. just uh, not worry about that, uh, you're not really going to use SYK model in your calculation, no, no, no. I think, yeah, at yeah. all, right? So, it just. At all, yeah, yeah. But if you mm -hmm. really want to do this calculation, which uh, we are trying to do, then uh, you hit this problem that the SYK is not conformally invariant. Exactly, you're absolutely right. So this, this dual picture is just some conceptual framework we should have in yeah. mind, yes. but we never are going to do any computations in this, in this side of the setup. Right, yeah. okay, thanks. thanks. But I want to emphasize that this right-hand side is really the fundamental description of, of the system we are trying to consider. And Suvrat has emphasized rightly that you know, there might be some qualitative features that might be different in this case, uh, instead of just having a full holographic thing, but uh, we'll keep those subtleties aside and, and just sort of proceed uh, ahead. Okay, so basically we have dynamical gravity in the ADS2 region and just no gravity in the flat space region. And moreover, we take this wire to be built from the same CFT2 that, is, that was propagating earlier just on the ADS2 side. And we, so basically we supply some transparent boundary conditions now to the fields. So the fields from the ADS region can just move to the flat space region and the field quanta from the flat space can move into the ADS region freely. Okay, so, so now you see what's going to happen is that this delta X plus and the delta X minus contributions to the bulk entropy are going to really be independent and we are really going to be uh, you know, having both of those contributions. Okay, but now let's try to see if something changed about this entanglement wedge of O. Okay, so we have this S gen, which is the dilaton term, this first term. Now we have this factor of two here from the delta X plus and the delta X minus, right? And there is still this uh, cutoff uh, dependence uh, on the vial factor. So now you see the omega just cancels one of these logs. And we are left with a function that looks like one over X, plus C times log X. And if we just draw this function, this is what it looks like, and it has a minimum. 
has a minimum at a value of x, which is not negative infinity, but is, is negative some finite value. So remember this phi r was a length scale. So now we get an a star, which is located not all the way at the Poincaré horizon, but is located at, at a finite value of a star. Okay, so just to, to summarize, we were trying to compute the entropy or the entanglement wedge of, of this region, of just the SYK part and not the wire. And what we found is that this SYK uh, quantum system is now uh, dual to just this smaller diamond. It's not dual to all of the Poincaré patch, it's just this blue diamond between A star and B. Okay, so, so that's what has happened. By coupling in this wire, sort of the entanglement wedge of just the SYK has sort of moved inwards from the Poincaré horizon uh, to this coordinate location. Okay, Th this might not sound too surprising. Okay, you coupled in something else. Of course, you should expect that, you know, now the state of the system is the coupled ground state is the coupled zero temperature ground state. So of course the properties of the entanglement and so on are going to be different. And indeed, like in hindsight, you know, it's not that all that surprising, indeed. Um, so, so what's the big fuss? But let's look at the entanglement wedge of the complement of the wire. So instead of looking at the SYK, we look at the uh, entanglement wedge of the complement. And because, again, the whole thing is dual to the whole thing, you know, if we draw this yellow line, which is a spatial flight, the region between A star and B sort of belong to the SYK dot. So these other, uh, you know, the rest of the yellow region from here to here, union this stuff should belong to the complement. So, so what we sort of are seeing is that this wire region, this blue region, which is sort of in the fundamental quantum description is connected, is just one region. In the dual, it sort of splits up into two pieces. Uh, the dual to that one region is the union of these two regions in gravity. Is this uh, the naive region, what we can call the naive region, and this island. So this, this piece will be called the island in this case. Um, okay, so, so that's what's surprising. It's surprising that uh, the entanglement, well, okay, maybe it's not that surprising, that the entanglement wedges can have these multiple connected components. And you can have something, this is sort of a big component far away in a flat space region, uh, but then you can have these other pieces in sort of gravitating regions, and they're sort of together form the subregion dual to this wire. So, uh, Raghu, uh, 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 yes. uh, just some bit small confusion. I mean, uh, this uh, A star right now in this situation didn't have any free parameter in it other than, so you would have thought that maybe the strength of the coupling to the wire or something should you should be able to tune between uh, the earlier case and this case is there uh, uh, maybe i'm missing something is yeah. it... no you're right and there isn't such a parameter in this model because essentially we have assumed that um you know the coupling is such that uh, it's sort of a very strong coupling that that this gravity and flat space are sort of effectively talking uh, to each other very well so yeah, so, this model sort of doesn't so now capture you're that. thinking of the whole thing as part of, uh, I mean, so the, it, there's no tunable parameter here. Uh, in uh, yes. it, It's part of a larger system. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or at least the coupling is so large that, you know, it, it's sort of irrelevant or it, it, the, the actual numerical value doesn't matter anymore. Okay. So, yeah. Sorry. Uh, Thank you. Yes. Just to follow up on that, uh, couldn't you introduce the coupling by having partially transparent and partially reflecting boundary conditions and then redo the computation? Uh, would that yeah, be... Okay, um, yes, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a, yeah, yes. Okay, may yeah, maybe if, that's... Yeah, what's a, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a good answer. Yeah, actually, yeah. But yeah, these, then this entanglement computation becomes harder. So you could have a fermion with sort of when it hits the boundary, it sort of partially transmits and partially reflects. So it would sort of interpolate between the previous case where the the wire is sort of completely decoupled and it's completely coupled. Good point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. The other question I had was actually related to some of the earlier questions we had. I know this is uh, 
maybe yeah. uh, so, so, but you know there was this discussion we had about how the area and how these uv divergences cancel and i was just wondering yeah. if you started off with uh, trying to compute the entanglement wedge of the wire itself so now there is a uv divergence yeah. in the part of the entanglement wedge that's coming from the island from the s qft of the island right uh, i mean the the part on the left if you go down to your figure uh, uh yeah uh -huh. uh huh yeah you know there, there there's a there's some divergence coming from the entanglement entropy of the cf of the bulk uh, cft that's living on that on that that the, near a star right you mean that's the right, field the near a star right and now there yeah. isn't a compensating divergence somehow coming from the a over 4 g newton term because i thought that was coming from near the boundary of um, ads so i mean is this something one needs to worry about sorry sorry um, sorry the yeah. bulk the bulk physics near a star is the thing we expect that will cancel the uv divergences right uh, right sorry let me just because yeah. um, because here there is the gravity is still active and it's fluctuating and so i, I see uh, i see so you're saying you're saying so now if you look at this union of these two diamonds there are two uv divergences one is coming from the right and one is coming from the left yeah yeah exactly that, uh, that i see so you're saying that the area term even to the left of a star will have exactly the right divergence to cancel off. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. Um, yeah. I wanted to sort of uh, uh, address Ashok's point from before. So, so, so we see now here in this case we had this quantum term. Well, the, the, these two both make up the quantum term, and we have something non-trivial that depends on x, which is sort of a, right? X is just the coordinate of a, but you see, there was an epsilon also here. There is a C over six log of epsilon UV that we are sort of sweeping under the rug and hoping it cancels against some other contributions and so on and so forth. So, so, but the claim is that these two terms in white here are the X dependent terms. And all the X independent stuff will sort of cancel out by this kind of arguments that are not completely rigorous. But but we see that the quantum term can indeed have a non-trivial dependence on A, like here. And those are precisely responsible for pushing the X star from minus infinity to this finite value. Okay. And what if the classical term also gets yeah. uh, renormalized? I mean, there is a G Newton hidden there, right? Or what yes, about the yeah, yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. if that gets so, a renormalization, I mean, how will so it cancel think, the epsilon? Right. So I think the, the statement is supposed to be that the one over G Newton here sort of gets replaced. So yeah, the, the statement is the one over G Newton bear and this log sort of combined to give the one over G Newton renormalized. So, you know, we can have two formulas like G Newton bear uh, area and uh, area over G Newton renormalized. And the point is that this plus these epsilon things, log epsilon, or in, in a higher dimension, it would be epsilon to the d minus 2. So it would be something like 1 over g Newton bear uh, plus uh, 1 over epsilon to the d minus 2, sort of combined to give a, a 1 over g Newton, you know, renormalized. So one has to use the correct uh, renormalized g Newton defined from some low energy experiment in that formula. Okay. But in is this that, case, it's, that, not, yeah. it's not a cancellation between the class, the normalization of the classical term and the renormalization of the quantum term, right? Which is what is normally said that both are area and hence they will cancel. No, because the quantum term seems to have a log depend, log x dependence. This is one over x. Ah. Uh, sorry, sorry. The, the renormalization of G Newton in two dimensions is by a log, right? Because this D is equal to two. So the epsilon to the D minus two is like a log epsilon in 2D. Okay, but that multiplies so, one over X. Yeah, yeah. So X is the, just some coordinate. So this, this whole thing is the area. This is equal to the area. Yes. Um, and you are extremizing I, this with respect to X, right? Yes, yes, yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I'm just wondering oh, that if, I see. if these two terms yeah. are different, 
epsilon. Yeah, how, you're saying there is no sort of one over x multiplying the log of epsilon. Yeah, exactly, so how do we yeah. sort of combine them? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Unless there is some while factor hidden, which also goes as one over x. I see. Um, okay, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I have to admit, I haven't thought about that, this issue. I, I was always thinking in terms of this, uh, uh, this kind of formulas in higher dimensions. And then these both sort of go like the area, and then they sort of, you know, get renormalized like yeah. this. But okay. yeah, you're right that there is this one over X. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, oh, I, I don't yeah. think I can do better right now. I'm sorry. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, okay. Excuse me, just one more question. Yeah. Could you please say on the right hand side, on the the flat yeah. side, Here? yeah, on the wire side, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so what do you mean by entanglement wedge on the wire side? I mean, it's just, it's, it's bulk of not any holographic theory, right? It's just. Right, so, so you should think that because you couple this wire to a holographic system, some right. kind of holography has infected the wire because the, the system is in a combined ground state. Okay. In the ground state of the SYK coupled to the wire. So, you know, they're, they're sort of the, the wave function of the combined system is entangled between the two. And, okay. and it has to, if you believe this picture and you believe that the total systems are dual to each other, then the comp, like by this complement argument, this has to be the case. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Good. Um, yeah. Okay, so just, but yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you please repeat the same argument again? Uh, I wasn't able to follow. Uh, will it take so, time? Uh, uh, in this figure, we computed the entanglement wedge of this uh, SYK dot, right? Yeah. Here. And that came out to be uh, this region between A star and B and the causal completion of that, causal development of that. Okay, now let's ask what is the complement of the system. The, the spatial complement is this orange stuff now, right? Yeah. And so what is the complement here? The, uh, the complement is- No, no, I complement. understood that. Uh, there yeah. was some question asked previously about the entanglement which in the uh, bath CFP, which doesn't have a gravity region. So uh, what did you uh, tell about that? I'm just repeating the same argument that uh, okay, the okay. orange sort of is dual to the union of these two oranges in okay. this figure. Uh, when the wire is coupled to the SYK, you should really think that, you know, there is some kind of gravity in the, in the dual description still. So it's in some way tuning the system turns gravity on in the bath CFT? Um, I, I really like to think of these two descriptions as different. So, you know, the, the, there is a full quantum complete description of the wire, which sits yeah. in this right-hand side description. And what enters in this gravity pictures is just some kind of, you know, low complexity or low energy subspace or some code subspace or something like that in this gravity picture. So you're not supposed to think of this orange uh, region in the flat space as being exactly the same as the wire. Because we are drawing pictures, you know, in this, in this 2D picture, we are working with some semi-classical actions and so on. So we don't know what the full UV complete description there is. So, so this really has to be interpreted in the spirit of ADS-CFT where, um, okay. you know, in the bulk, the only sort of legal actions you're allowed to do are the ones where should not cause too much back reaction unless otherwise they will just change the whole geometry. And this is sort of okay. familiar from this discussions of all this uh, stuff in usual ADS CFT. Um, Thanks. Uh, uh, Rabbi, can I ask a question? Sorry. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. So, so when you're using this uh, step where you're, you know, like saying about the complement. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering whether there is an assumption here in the sense that 
uh, it, it is it might very well be true that when you're calculating the internal entropy of the xyk dot yeah. uh, real computation is dominated by a certain saddle point mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but you know like uh, it is not clear that when you're calculating the internal entropy of the wire uh, mm -hmm. the calculation there should be dominated by the same saddle point right so it could be yeah, yeah, yeah. That, uh, yeah you're right that, uh, that there's this diamond and, and then there's a dual but then in the dual computation the, when you're doing the wire computation um, the dual has uh, uh, i understand the question yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. so this was actually a confusion in this aemm paper so when almeri engelhardt Merolf, and maxfield wrote their paper in may they raised precisely this question that there seems to be this naive entanglement wedge of the wire which is just this blue region here and then that union, this this other diamond, is not the full space, right? So, so what is going on? And so, really, uh, we gained confidence in 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 this complementary, uh, you know, business because of this model that I have not talked about, which is this doubly holographic model, like this Randall Sundaram kind of setup. And there, it sort of becomes completely transparent that something like this has to happen. So. Uh, I can describe that. Maybe instead of yeah, just yeah. going into more details, it would be useful to sort of describe that uh, quickly. Sorry, Abu, I'm, 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 I'm just not asking about the full geometry itself, but I'm asking, like, you know, like, why, how do you know that there are no non geometric contributions in the wire entanglement entropy? Right. I'm asking a question of that sort, you know. Um, non geometric, sorry. Um, yeah, that, that there are no like same this at point. It's some, it, it, it's, it's you know, I mean, if I'm skeptical, I can say the con the calculation of the wire internal entropy might be completely beyond the you know like uh, supergravity uh, description, right. and maybe right, right, right. take it account all sorts of things, uh, and and that is what you should equate, and uh, and and this uh, thing that you're writing down is just. Uh, one contribution to that entire thing, you know, like uh, uh, mm -hmm. because because this doesn't follow from even if I assume that you know, like I I I, I understand the extremal uh, quantum extremal surface prescription. Okay, uh, yeah. let's say I grant you that that computes the S Y K dots uh, entanglement entropy correctly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, but 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 that still doesn't mean that. Uh, it computes the wire correctly, right? Uh, isn't that an additional assumption? Or? Right. So the assumption here is that these two systems are really dual, right? That's maybe an equivalent way of stating the assumption. Yes, the they're dual. Assumption here. They're dual, but uh, but yeah. but in general, you're kind of you'll have to kind of uh, sum over all the geometries in the left uh, bits, right? Left triangle. Uh, I mean, they're dual in the sense of where you integrate over the gravity in the left triangle. Um, well, I'm not, okay, I'm not really, I, I think it, it is w true that this not, yes. Uh, no, I was just saying, I think this W holographic thing might help to answer Loga's question. I mean, which is that, yeah, I think, right. yeah, the, you mm -hmm. have in mind is that the wire itself it has a, some CFT, which is itself is dual to an ADS, you know, and, and then, then you apply the, the usual RT prescription to the, the entanglement yeah. of the region on that wire. You know, right, that's what I was sort of answering initially, uh, but I thought maybe Loga didn't want to have that kind of an answer. But that's exactly yeah, that's exactly was the motivation of our paper with the you know the first paper with Ying on this doubly holographic setup is to sort of make sure that uh, these things are correct. That uh, right. Okay. So 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 if I understood this answer right, that that uh, that in 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 some other setup where the wire itself can be dualized. You see that yes. this works, and that is a that yes. is a good motivation uh, to yeah. uh, to put forward. Yeah. This that, yes. uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Is that is that, but, is that the statement that you answer? But that? that's not the strongest. That's sort of one indication. The other indication is you could go ahead and set up the replica trick for this wire system, and because this so so don't so let's think of the n equal to two, the computation of the second Rennie entropy. So you mm -hmm. will have sort of two replicas and so on. And in this paper with Hartman and Almeri and Juan, like this, this other paper, 
they sort of showed how this A star can appear in that N equal to two geometry. Mm -hmm. And so even there, it's sort of, uh, and Merdad even had a paper uh, like yesterday or two days ago, like doing that calculation even numerically. So, so, so what you see is that really in these replica, you know, computations of the higher Rennie entropies, there is a sort of a non-trivial saddle point uh, represented by the nucleation somehow of this A star point. Um, uh, by, by, by nucleation, I mean that there are some twist operators that you would put here, right, in the naive via region. Yeah. But since the gravity is sort of fluctuating, you can have uh, emergent twist operators because just that, 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 that geometry fluctuates and you can have additional sort of connections between the geometry regions. So it's pretty clear at this point that, uh, that this, this is the correct answer, even if you don't have a doubly holographic setup. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, good. Um, so I was just going to sort of put more meat on this uh, calculation by now, you know, computing. Uh, we'll go over this quickly because this is not maybe very conceptually important. What you can do with the same set of formulas is compute the entanglement wedge of the SYK plus like a finite piece of the wire uh, that say has length B, so from zero to B. And the position of the extremal surface, the A star, will be a function of B, okay? So anyway, you set up this B, you have a candidate A, you write the extremal entropy functional, right? So, so this is the delta X plus term, this is the wild term. Okay, you extremize, uh, you get some condition, which is here. Okay, so you just again get some phi R over A star. Earlier B was zero, so now B is non-zero. But one thing which this sort of highlights is that the dependence on B is sort of makes sense. If you take B to infinity, sort of A star goes to minus infinity. So, so as you move this point B further and further this way, right? That means you're computing the entanglement wedge of almost the entire system, then you should get almost the entire Poincaré wedge, Poincaré patch. And sort of this formula gives us that because uh, yeah, when B goes to infinity, A star is almost equal to B plus a little bit. Uh, okay, so, so, so this is the thing. So when B is very large, A star is equal to B plus some, some, some piece. So it's also getting big. So can I ask a yes. na naive question? I'm sorry, but yes, it has yes. to do with this ultraviolet cutoff actually in the uh -huh. in the right side. So that's that's just the ultraviolet cutoff uh, of ordinary flat space theory, right? So uh, in this formula, you mean? Uh, yeah, in all these entanglement. So previously, yes. when Ashok asked that question, the renormalization most probably there is a wild factor in uh, dividing this epsilon which is x and therefore you could conceive of uh, understanding the renormalization of newton's coupling actually okay but now there is no gravity right uh, so uh, what happens to the what happens to this uh, ultraviolet uh, so so in this region in the ads there is still a gravity yeah that's right but uh, so the 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 uv divergences at the point A are supposed to cancel. Okay. Because of the same effect. This is related to what Subrat asked uh, a while, a bit, uh, just a few minutes ago. But what so about the a, UV divergence? Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah, so the UV divergences at A do cancel. In, in Well, yes. up to this, you know, subtlety that Ashok raised that I, yes, I yes, can't yes. answer right now, but they're expected to cancel at A. But uh, I'm asking about the right hand side region, actually. There also about you're the using. B. Yeah, I mean, you're oh, yeah, using yeah. SF, this yeah. formula good, there. Good, good. Right, right, right. right. So, so we are using that formula there. But the, the thing I'm emphasizing is the thing we are extremizing is just little a. So I claim that these three terms here are in all of the formulas I've presented. There is no other little a dependence. So there might be some infinite things that I'm dropping, but those will be independent of A. So we can sort of contest the value of the entropy that we get 
but the extremization is going to be unchanged. Yes, the extremization over A. Just because B doesn't depend on A, it's just some point that we chose. Uh, so, so okay. Raghu, uh, yeah. When you use these formulas, you're going to assume that the wire is in some thermal state or the CFT is in some thermal state at some temperature, so you can use the calabrese cardi formulas? Yeah, so right now I'm just in the zero temperature vacuum of the coupled system. Oh, you're just in the zero temperature vacuum. I see. Okay. Right, so right. That's why we have been to doing... the finite temperature state, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was the plan, but <laughs> I'm not sure how much of the finite temperature case we are going to be able to do. But so, yeah, sorry, exactly. even in the zero temperature vacuum, sorry, let me ask a, maybe a dumb question. Is it clear that when you take this uh, this theory in the bulk and it's coupled to gravity, that the wave function is is accurately approximated by zero temperature or is that because the central charge is large and so you believe that it is just uh, the vacuum wave function it, is correct? I mean, I should have asked this question much earlier. The vacuum wave function from the gravity perspective or from the, the quantum yeah. mechanical? Yeah, from the, you know, your compute, you're using the calabrese Cardi formula, which is kind of assuming that the CFT on this region, on this, you know, yeah. uh, uh, you know, in the, in the region where gravity is dynamical and in the region where it's not, is kind yeah. of in, in the vacuum state. Yes, yes, I guess yes, that's yes, yes. That's good because C is very large and so you don't, somehow you don't care about the back reaction. Right? Uh, yeah. C Sorry, is I, large. I was uh, just thinking there's a region where gravity is dynamical, so the CFT might not be in its, in what Calabrese and Cardi call the vacuum. I mean, the wave function of the CFT oh, has to be modified. Yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the back reaction is not important okay, in this, right. okay, thanks, yeah, thanks. in this limit, yeah. I yeah, so C is I large thought... enough for the one loop term to be important. I mean, there are two bounds on C. So C is much larger than one so that, you know, the one loop term is, uh, is, is sort of meaty, but this is sort of less than uh, some, some one over G Newton. So it doesn't back react. So the, okay, so the back reaction parameter is controlled by C over G Newton, which is still small. Fine, thank you. And we can do that because we have a parametric sort of separation like that. Exactly. Um, right. Wait, I thought that earlier you said there's, there is no approximation because ADS2 is um, conformal to Minkowski. So you had the formula for Minkowski. All you do is a conformal transformation to get the exact entropy on ADS2. And that's how you got the omega factors, right? Well, one way of saying it, well, yeah, one way of saying no it, it. Then there is no question no, of that. Uh, uh, there is because, so the equation that you have to solve for the dilaton, so my previous statement was in this approximation here. The equation of motion for the dilaton is sort of grad mu, grad mu phi, is sort of t mu nu, right? And the solution that this phi r over x that we have been using, is sort of assumes that the t mu nu is small, is zero. Right, so, 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 so this phi r over x is, is solving some differential equation on this background. It's some equation of motion for the dilaton. So if the back reaction of the matter fields become important, but the dilaton profile is not going to remain the same. So, so, so this, 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 this term will be different. Okay. And it's, it's actually important to compute that back reaction when the black hole is evaporating. So in this mm -hmm. case, often because at large times this back reaction builds up because, you know, this this area term has to become smaller because of Hawking evaporation. So in an evaporating black hole, it's actually a complicated calculation to solve this equation in the presence of this Hawking flux. So T mu nu would be the Hawking flux, and you have to sort of back react that on the dilaton. But this is exactly what CGHS did, you know, to compute the evaporation of the CGHS black holes back in the day. Mm -hmm. Mm, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, okay. Good. Um, uh, okay. So here I was just emphasizing this fact that uh, uh, this this dependence of a star on b also makes sense. Um, Okay, and there's just one quick other point, this extremization condition in the presence of this B, you know, this left-hand side is positive. So the right-hand side had also better be positive. And what this means is that A star is bigger than B. And this inequality is also actually, it is enforced by the quantum focusing conjecture. 
Now, our, our paper discusses this. I won't have time to go into this today, but this is also, again, a nice check that all these sort of ideas sort of enforce each other in some sense. So quantum focusing implies A star equals B, and the extremization of this generalized entropy is sort of consistent with that. It, it returns an answer, which is A star bigger than B. So here I'm just trying to show what the A star bigger than B means. So this, this is sort of the reflection of the point B in this in this line and A star is, is sort of further to the left than that. Uh, okay, um, uh, maybe it's like we should stop here for questions. I, I also have to address Rajesh's question from the beginning of the one loop uh, uh, thing. So I think I, I sort of answered it here where we say that we assume uh, this kind of a separation in the central charge. So so we take a one over G Newton term, and then there is an order C term. And um, right, and, and I think the next term, which is sort of order G Newton, is like one over N squared. Uh, so, so I think in this limit, it's okay to sort of just keep these two terms. Um, yeah. But again, this is this is a trick that is familiar from the CGHS uh, computations back back in the day. Uh, can I ask uh, an, yeah. an I question? Uh, suppose we change the central charge to be of uh, order n. Does this change the page curve of Hawking radiation, which we observe in the given setup? Oh, okay, you mean order n as opposed to n squared or something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, n squared or n yeah, squared or n squared? Yeah, I haven't thought about that case, uh, so I wouldn't be able to sort of think about it in real time. But the idea is if you make C too large, then sort of the black hole in the evaporating case would evaporate too quickly. Okay. You know, I mean, it'll just like go out in a pop and because there's too many matter fields coupled to it, so it just evaporates okay. very suddenly. So the dynamics are sort of not really controlled anymore. Uh, that's sort of the idea. Uh, so, so this condition is also important to sort of have a slow evaporation that they're sort of, you know, the entropy of the, the black hole loses its entropy and mass slowly over time, sort of adiabatically. Um, and uh, in uh, normal flat space evaporation process, we assume that uh, evaporation tends to uh, change with time, meaning black hole evaporates faster at later times. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Does, some, does something similar happen in this setup also? Uh, so, yeah, because it will happen in the evaporating case, yeah. Uh, here, because the central charge is fixed, we cannot uh, 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 change the well, rate of evaporation. Well, the rate of evaporation not just depends on the central charge, also depends on the temperature of the black hole. Okay. And as the black hole is evaporating, its temperature is changing. So okay. the, the evaporation rate does change. I mean, there's uh, a Stephen Boltzmann law for the, as it radiates, it cools down and then it's sort of the, yeah. Okay. So you can't analyze the very end of the evaporation where it will be sort of, it will leave this regime of good approximations. Um, uh, but we do know that uh, the curve flattens out uh, at late times. Well, in this case, yes, but I was talking about the evaporating case for the, yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for the previous comment. Uh, uh, so if we yeah. try to make up the remark from the Jeff Pennington's paper, uh, in which he t talks about uh, the recovering the page curve for uh, uh, an evaporating black hole. Will those complications uh, make uh, something subtle? Yeah, they make the computations much harder. Those um, were done in this AEMM paper from May last year. Um, meaning, will they can they modify the page curve? at late times, uh, such uh, ultraviolet. Oh, they costs. can't compute that. They can't compute the very late time limit of the evaporation. Thank you. Uh, okay, so 
I think we are already uh, kind of beyond time. And uh, uh, like, if it, so I'm going to just quickly maybe just since this is a case of physical importance. So in the non-zero temperature case, we imagine sort of two SYKs coupled to two wires. And so this is in a combined thermal state at temperature beta. And the left-hand system is just purifying it. And together, they are sort of in a thermal field double state. OK, and uh, so here is sort of the Penrose diagram. The yellow is the original Poincaré patch. And now we sort of have to go to describe a finite temperature thing. We have to be in the Rindler patch of ADS, which is sort of, sort of between these, this kind of a cross here, like that. And then it's sort of joined to the flat space regions on this side. Uh, what really changes is not the local form of the metric because you know in this JT gravity, the Ricci scalar is fixed to minus two. So the metric is just going to be locally ADS to everywhere. What changes is the profile of the diloton. So, so here is just the, the metric, which is the same as before. X plus minus X minus is X, the spatial X. So that's why this is here. And this, this is just some coordinate change to rewrite it, to you know, make it go from the Poincaré patch to the Rindler patch. But this metric is literally equal with some exponential change of coordinates that we are familiar to go between finite temperature and vacuum configurations in a CFD2. So what's really different about the non-zero temperature is the dilaton profile. So as we said, the dilaton is solving some differential equation. And this is an, also a solution to the uh, differential equation for the dilaton. So earlier, the temperature was just 0. So now we pick up some term that's proportional to x plus times x minus. So it's like t squared minus x squared. And uh, so, that's, so, so you just have some different profile. Okay, And the entropy computations, the matter entropy computations, are also a little bit harder because we are now in a thermal state. So we have to keep track of the thermality and we have to keep track of all the while factors, but that's literally all there is to it. So, so you just have to sort of repeat uh, this calculation a bunch of times. So for example, you could compute the entanglement wedge for this. The left SYK union may be a little bit of the left wire, okay? And you would get an extremization condition which is similar to the one I showed you before, but with some betas and cinches in the formula, the cinches come because of these exponentials that are there. And again, A star is bigger than B because of quantum focusing and so on. Okay, let me just uh, skip this. So here I'm just solving for A star in terms of B. That doesn't, doesn't really matter too much. But now um, uh, let's sort of consider, you know, this subsystem, this interesting subsystem, which is uh, sort of this region in the right wire and it's sort of partner system in the left wire. So this blue shaded region on the right union, the left. And now we sort of imagine running time forwards on both sides. So, you know, the eternal black hole geometries have a boost symmetry, uh, but if we move things forwards in time on both sides, uh, this is a, a well-known thing, a trick in holography to get some simple time dependence the entropies start increasing linearly in time. So the entropy of this blue region will increase linearly in time uh, if we move time forwards on both sides. This is very similar to the hartmann maldacena paper from 2013 or something where they computed such a linear increase. But uh, the point is going to be that the entropy of the blue regions is again equal to the complement and the complement is some black hole uh, whose entropy is bounded by sort of two times the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, right? So therefore, uh, there will be sort of an entropy paradox. And this, this paradox was emphasized by Samir Mathur in a paper from also from 2014, I think. So he sort of emphasized this point and the, re the resolution is uh, the appearance of an island at late time. Uh, uh, let me just, just uh, show me, you. Why, the, yes. why, two, yeah. why two times SBH? Because there's one here and one here. 
Wait, but there's only one black hole, right? Well, there are it's sort of there's a wormhole, so you should think of it as a pair of black holes that are entangled with each other. Well, there's a left, you know, system and a right system. Well, if you take two black there's... holes, which are which do not have a wormhole, anything in between, they're very far away from each other. Then what is the total entropy of the two black holes? It's twice of one black hole, right? But if they're correlated, which means if they're connected with the wormhole, then it'll just one factor of S, not two. Okay, I'm not really sure. Well, let me just say in SYK, you know, there's an N here. So its entropy is bounded by N. And you just have two times the fermion. So its entropy is bounded by 2N or something, right? In the factor of two comes out, uh, it comes out right. So. Okay. okay, maybe you should. Uh, could you ask one more time uh, your question? Uh, sure. I was saying that in the bulk, you have a eternal black, a thermophile double state, right? Yes. So the entropy of that is just S black hole. It's not twice of S black hole. Well, the entropy of what, right? You have to ask that. It's the entropy of just, for example, if we didn't have the wires, the S black hole is the entropy of this guy, right? Mm, right. Because together they would be in a pure state and this entropy would be S black hole. That is correct. And yeah. so, so S A B, well, you know, what's happening here is S left right is zero, but S left plus S right is two times S black hole, right? Because S left and S right are both equal oh, okay. and equal okay. to sure, S sure. black hole. Sure, yeah. Um, okay, uh, anyway, so the point is uh, at early times you have this blue region, which are the naive uh, sort of in regions you would associate uh, to the entanglement wedge. And indeed at early times, this is what it is. Uh, okay, there's some computational details. Let's skip them, uh, okay, blah, blah. Um, okay, so this I already said that it's bounded by two times S black hole. And here I have tried to depict this late time situation. So you have this yellow sort of Cauchy slice, which has now moved up on both sides. So the Cauchy slice has moved up and uh, you get sort of this island. So this region is sort of the island for the union of these two radiation systems. And uh, that's what you get when you plug in these uh, formulas for the entropy. So, so what we say then is that the entanglement wedge of this part of the wire and this part of the wire together is equal to the naive regions, this union, that, union, this whole thing. So again, we get some disconnected piece of the entanglement wedge in the bulk. Okay, and once you get this, uh, the entropy sort of no longer increases. The entropy no longer increases, you can just compute it and uh, you find this curve. So there is this initial increase it would have gone on, but then it gets cut off by sort of a second extremal surface that comes. So it's like a first order transition between saddles. There are two candidate surfaces and you have to pick sort of the smaller one also. So this is how sort of you're saved from an entropy paradox, like this kind of entropy paradox in this case. Okay, so now, uh, sorry, okay. What I want to say is that uh, I, I'm going to completely skip over this higher dimensional thing. Uh, it's not, That's it's not, not sort of, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Uh, if you need more time, then you can take like half an hour more if you want. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think still, uh, maybe there, we would still have some time for a half an hour discussion, yeah, yeah. I think, but I, I want to make some conceptual points. Sure. On, Unless, like, I don't want to discuss the, the higher dimensional case because it's pretty similar to Hartman Maldacena setup. Uh, yeah, okay. Just, just I, your, your decision with the higher dimensional case is of some, some interest. So, I mean, if you, uh, if, it, uh, oh. if you feel you don't have time, then please, please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay. Maybe I'll discuss. Okay, since there is interest, maybe. 
Okay, so let me quickly say uh, an important point, which is the physically, well, the initial interesting case is the evaporating black hole, which, you know, we just have some one-sided, so, so this is supposed to be the horizon, this is supposed to be some kind of boundary transitioning between the gravity region and the radiation region, and we are trying to compute the entropy of the radiation here, and what you find at very late times is again some the entanglement wedge has a disconnected piece, and this time it's behind the horizon. So again, you find an A star, and this uh, entanglement wedge of the radiation is equal to radiation union this island. So we can ask, uh, you know, what is the intuitive reason that including this island was beneficial? Okay, so there is one computation that we have to make sure that A star is actually extremizing it. But we have sort of two saddles. We have a saddle one. This naive saddle, if we didn't include the island, still continues to be a saddle. And then there's a saddle two, right, which includes this island piece. In saddle two, we pay a price. The price is the value of the dilaton at A star, or in higher dimensions, it would be the area of the boundary of this island. So you pay a price. So you might think, okay, it's not worth it to include it because in the minimization, it's going to lose over saddle one. But the point is, because this black hole has been hawking evaporating for so long, there are sort of these Alice-Bob pairs that have formed. So, so there's, there's a Bell pair whose partners are sort of one in the island and one in the radiation, one in the island, one in the radiation. So if you actually include the island, you save on the s bulk term because if you didn't include the island, you were going to get a contribution to S bulk, which would have been like the number of, you know, EPR partners times log two or something. But, you know, if you say that I'm going to include the partners in the region I'm considering, then together they don't contribute to S bulk. So you lose on the area, but you save on the S bulk. And this is sort of the nice trade off that the Engelhardt wall formula sort of you know, lands us on. Uh, so sorry, this is really yeah, the, yeah. yeah. Uh, so in the, in the, uh, just very dumb, dumb question, what happened to the homology constraint and why, 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 uh, why don't we worry about it when we have the island, you know, why shouldn't so we? This is actually, it? yeah, yeah, so exactly. So this is again in the doubly holographic setup. This has a very nice answer. Um, so let me just say for, for people who maybe already know about it. So, so here I'm just going to draw space. So here is some space, which is sort of, the, you know, the, the right region, the radiation region. We have some joining to this gravity region, right? There is some gravity region. I'm not drawing time here. And there is this additional emergent holographic direction where right. the radiation is itself a, a holographic CFT. And then we are trying to compute the entanglement wedge of this radiation, right? from That's here to here, that is it. So it's actually homologous through this additional di dimension, right? So what will happen is that the quantum extremal surface will end up here and the three dimensional uh, entanglement wedge will be this whole thing here. And it's allowed to end here because this, this brain is actually dynamical. So, you know, this, 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 this region here sort of counts, does not count towards the homology constraint. It, it's, yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. That, I understand. But is this is this something we? I mean, I, yeah. Is, is this a rule we so we, like, uh, we made up a little bit, or was it? Uh, 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 is this? Uh, uh, no, no. I think in the Randall syndrome, it's completely clear that these kind of things have to be allowed because uh, this is kind of like this emergent twist operator in the replica discussion. So because the brain itself is fluctuating in these Randall syndrome geometries, right? Uh, when you set up the path integral, you're allowed to have sort of in, in the replicas, the connections going through the brain because the brain has dynamical gravity on it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's how sort of this homology constraint is satisfied. You should, okay, thanks, even thanks. in this evaporating black hole case, you can think of, you know, a third dimension coming out of the board. If the, if the radiation system was itself holographic, and then these two blue, this blue and this blue would be sort of, there would be sort of a blue region that comes out of this naive entanglement wedge 
comes up, goes across to the left, and then joins onto the island region. Okay, okay thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this is one intuition that I wanted to give uh, about w when it is useful to include this island. So that's, that's what I'm saying here. So the, the savings in S bulk have to be big enough to pay for the area, right? Um, otherwise, it just doesn't work. Uh, okay, and then I want to sort of emphasize a point, which is that the entropy is a special quantity. Now, all we have been doing is some stupid path integral over geometries, right? It's some souped up version of uh, semi-classical gravity where, okay, you are tr trying to maybe include some topology change and so on and so forth but it still doesn't have any strings or brains or any kind of hints of a UV completion of gravity, okay? So I just want to emphasize that this trace row log row or things like trace of row to the N are just one number or sort of dim H numbers out of dim H squared matrix elements of row. So if I think of, so what's row? Row is sort of the out state of the, so let's say the black hole is completely gone and we just have some state uh, of the radiation. It's a pure state, but okay, we can always write a pure state even as a density matrix. And in some simple basis, it will be some complicated matrix with these many number of matrix elements. And somehow the, the nice thing seems to be that these Rennie entropies are sort of, to compute the Rennie entropies is sort of enough to focus on a path integral over geometry or trace row log row is sort of a, one of the family of these observables. But, uh, and this is what this recent paper of Douglas and he also gave a talk about this. It's related to this comment that, you know, we should not expect this path integral over space time manifolds or a path integral over geometries to give us every single row IJ matrix element. Uh, that, that, that the full out state, you know, probably needs the full UV completion of gravity. Uh, because all this entropy business, you know, we never even talked about, for example, the singularity. It just never appeared. It, this quantum extremal surface stays away from it. All the formulas you extremize just don't get close to the singularity at all. So, so, so we are getting something, but in some sense, what we are learning is that we need to sort of move beyond this page curve and sort of, you know, now try to think about computing the out state itself, like this row ij instead of trace row to the end the tent and so on okay it's nice and it's a signal of unitarity that comes down but it it somehow was a little bit disappointing that it didn't probe the singularity at all and i think that to compute this row ij for e for all i and j will require some kind of uh, 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 inputs from uv completions like string theory and how the singularity is resolved and so on uh, so I can ask, even for the entanglement entropy, how important was it that you were in exactly the thermal state or exactly a state prepared by the Euclidean path integral? I mean, if I took some generic pure state on both sides, which, you know, for many correlators looks like uh, the yeah. thermal state, we know the entanglement entropy can be different. So, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, how, how yeah, important yeah. Uh -huh. was that you were in a very specific state for these calculations? Uh, well, yeah, it is important, at least for you know, the calculations we have in the papers that I wrote. But for example, in the evaporating black hole case, I would say that the state is more generic because you throw in a shock, right? That just dumps some energy into the ADS side. It, it collapses and forms a black hole. And then you sort of follow the evaporation, you follow the back reaction. And it's, it's sort of a robust conclusion that there is this quantum extremal surface at late time. Um, I see, but doesn't this conclusion rely on computing the entropy of the quantum fields and making an assumption about what precisely that is? But you're saying that's uh, robust. From oh, okay. Maybe you're saying if you set up some crazy state in the bulk, which is sort of non-typical and, you know, it, it's sort yeah, of just those the states, hawking it radiation. Work. Yeah. yeah, but the page yeah, yeah. curve also doesn't work for those states. But I'm, but I'm wondering, is that right. is that all we need that... Um, uh, you know, just to say once more, uh, you know, there's, there's this, uh, the reason this phase transition occurs is because at some point the entanglement builds up between the outside and the inside, right? So, so that's yes, why you're exactly. yeah. able to. But uh, if yeah. you had a, yeah, if you had generic pure states, that entanglement, yeah, would, would kind of turn around by itself, right? If you had a pure state uh, uh, 
um, I don't. I'm not saying something very precise. I should. I haven't thought about this very carefully. Uh, but you know, if you had a, if you had a, uh, uh, if you were not in exactly the thermal state, that entanglement itself might be different in pure states. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. I think. Yeah. And you're but saying I think in the spirit of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think in the spirit of this page, you know, page computed the page curve by assuming some kind of model of a pure state, which is somehow exactly. random, like there's drawn That's from some. So right. at that level, if you take a generic state, you expect this tenth thing. Right. And, but, you know, there definitely will be some kind of small fluctuations around this and things like that, you know. Now, of course, gravity doesn't get these right. That you just get some straight lines, right? So. At that level of detail, yes, you don't capture that, but um, okay. at least you know you capture it sort of very well. I see. Okay. And it's it's not like it's not actually like the spectral form factor quantity. So if you compute like ZZ star, there are some sort of the gravity sort of gets this this ramp and this plateau right, but it doesn't get these crazy fluctuations which are of the order of the signal itself. Right. Here, I think. The, the statement is that the fluctuations are smaller than the signal, are much, much smaller than the signal. So you've sort of computed more in some sense. It's like a self-averaging quantity. So this is sort of self-averaging and the ZZ star is not self-averaging. And so therefore, in this sense, we got lucky with the page curve. I see. Uh, let, maybe I can ask the question more precisely. So let's say you try to set up the replica trick uh, uh, path integral for these uh, calculations. Uh, and yeah. instead of just doing the Euclidean integral, you inserted some operator, you know. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh -huh. So you're saying that would uh -huh. not affect the, the saddle points and the transition between them? Not by too much, yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. Uh, okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Ask a, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, please. Uh, let, okay. Uh, I'm sorry for taking some time. I just need to think for, okay, I can ask it later. I'm very sorry. Okay, no problem. I need some okay. time. Yeah, yeah, take your time. You can ask, uh, ask maybe at the end. So, Jewel, did you say like uh, maybe 15 minutes more? Can we go on for that much? Uh, yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, Okay, so since Suvrat asked about this higher dimensional uh, setup, it also sort of gives me a chance to introduce this this doubly holographic thing maybe more a bit more slowly. So this two-dimensional CFT is one case where we can compute the uh, entropies because of Cardi Calabrese. Now, of course, the second scenario in which F bulk can be computed is if we assume that this matter CFT D plus one has a ADS D plus two duo. So D was equal to uh, zero for SYK. So, so um, sorry, D was equal to one for SYK. D was equal to one for, for this SYK setup. So we have this wire which forms a CFT two, right? So, so D is one, so, but then assume that the CFT two has an ADS three duo. And then this S bulk term, so we have area, over 4G plus S bulk. Now this S bulk sort of itself gets geometrized as an RT term in this higher dimensional ADS space. So, so, so we sort of completely geometrize even this guy, right? And that was sort of the idea in, in our first paper. Um, okay, so in, in this paper with Almeri and Santos, we actually went to D equals three. So that means the highest dimension you encounter in this hierarchy is ADS5. Okay, so, so this system has sort of three different descriptions. So there's a purely quantum mechanical description which I like to think of as a fundamental description. So it's a two plus one D holographic QFT, which sort of sits at the boundary of a three plus one D QFT. This is, this is like the wire. This is like the SYK from before, okay? So yeah, okay, uh, fine. Uh, and then there's a one step, which is sort of the real world, so to speak, in which this SYK or this two plus one D holographic QFT is replaced by its gravity dual. So we have a three plus one dimensional gravity 
and then it's still coupled to this to this wire system, right? So, so this is sort of a real world black hole evaporating into some matter. But then we sort of geometrize this QFT three plus one. Okay, so we have a gravity three plus one on a brain inside ADS four plus one, and so so this is precisely what Randall and Sundram and Karch and many other people sort of studied back in the day is to study sort of gravity as brains embedded inside ADS. And uh, when ADS-CFT sort of happened, there were papers by Steve Gobser and other people sort of explaining precisely these three uh, descriptions of the, of the Randall syndrome setup. And that's sort of a, I wouldn't say this kind of dualities between these descriptions is as rigorously established as for usual ADS-CFT, but it's sort of our best guess. Uh, are there questions about this three descriptions and the relations between them? Uh, yeah, uh, I just want yeah, uh, uh, just uh, say a little more about this last point about rigorously established. So you have to be a little yeah. careful about the, the tension of this brain and, and how it solves the equations of motion and so on. Right? Yes, like, yes, 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 definitely. That's what we did in this paper. Right, exactly. So in the purely quantum mechanical system, what is the, I mean, for instance, what is the parameter that controls the tension of this brain? You know, I mean, how do you put in all of these these parameters in your description one, which is the fundamental description? Yeah, so yeah, let's think. What was it? Yeah, so there is a brain tension parameter that enters, and uh, right, I think that enters as sort of an effective Newton's constant of this uh, three plus one d theory. So, so in this sort of Randall syndrome setup, right? there are sort of two scales. There's a Newton's constant um, in, in this 5D theory and then the gravity that gets induced on it. Right. So I'm just thinking out loud. So there are these two things, but you're asking about, about this fundamental description. What right, is right. it? Right. Good question. Um, Oh, I, I I don't have a clear answer. Yeah, it's it's controlling something about the state, but I don't know exactly what uh, what it is. Okay. Okay. Think. Uh, yeah, this tension parameter definitely changes the geometry, so it it changes sort of the details of you know, for example, uh, the RT uh, surfaces and entropies and so on. So geometrically, it's clear that it it it, it is a parameter, um, but uh, yeah. I, let let I, me not let me not say anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you're saying. I mean, the the guess is that that if you have, I mean, you have a CFT and it coupled to like one more CFT where gravity was dynamical, and somehow the guess is that this is uh, yeah that this is described by yeah. The, there is some kind of uh, coupling yeah. constant or the relative number of degrees of freedom between Actually, that that might be it. So there, there's like a central charge of, of this theory, right? Two plus one d QFT, and there's a central charge of the of this wire, and okay. there's sort of a relative parameter there. I think, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I see. And yeah, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, so there's so a C. Can I ask yeah. a uh, yeah. So uh, the island description seems to suggest that uh, Hawking radiation seems to be a bit different from the local QFT set because uh, Hawking radiation contains regions called islands in the black hole interior. So Hawking radiation yeah. should, uh, first of all, be state dependent. And uh, it's a non-local quantity because it's uh, containing its EPR partners in the interior of uh, black hole. So it seems to suggest that we shouldn't be expecting a, a local QFT page curve necessarily for the Hawking radiation. Uh, meaning, page curve was no, 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 no. So that's not true. So the fundamental description is again this wire, which is completely local, and the non-locality is only in the gravity description, and but we know that there are many hints that gravity has non-locality in it. And this kind of island being very far away from the naive radiation region is just another one of these okay. sort of 
signatures of non-locality in the gravity. You know, I want to emphasize that there is a fundamental wave function which is defined in this wire plus SY casing. And the pictures in the gravity only capture some kind of low complexity or low number of operators in this code subspace acting on the, on the, on the geometry that you're considering. So, so the pictures with this island and so on are not the, I, I, yeah, I would say that it's a way to make sense of the page curve if you sort of insist on using the geometry, right? You know, if you could solve the BFSS matrix model or something, or the BMN matrix model, you would find a description of the purity of Hawking radiation purely within the matrix degrees of freedom. But that's sort of an impossible task given our current state of the knowledge, right? So, so, so this picture is sort of a semi-classical picture of how special quantities like trace row log row or trace row to the n um, can be sort of made consistent with unitarity, just staying within these pictures of path integral over metrics. So it's a, the page curve is something observed by a semi-classical observer, meaning an observer who can only measure small point correlation functions. Uh, I'm suggesting this because uh, I want uh, I want to relate it to Zubit's uh, setup on the constant uh, curve in contrast to the page curve. For an observer at the boundary, you can measure high point correlators. Uh, I don't uh, know if uh, I seem to find both of the suggestions to be true, meaning the island description coming from the replica tip. And uh, the, though I need to understand it uh, much more precisely, but uh, the gist of Soren's paper is uh, appearing clear to me that the page curve sh should be replaced by a constant curve for uh, an ultraviolet observer. Uh, no, no, no. no, no, no. The, constant yeah. thing, the, co the constant thing is for a different setup. The evaporating black hole is a different setup. So it's a different physical situation where, you know, the thermal equilibrium case at finite temperature, the black hole is not evaporating. It's sort of, you know, in the thermal field double state, there are sort of radiation coming in from scry minus that's feeding the black yeah, hole. Yeah. It's emitting radiation and it's absorbing it. So, so that's why it sort of okay. approaches a constant and doesn't go down. Uh, so, no, so those two setups are very different. Suppose we consider a flat space uh, setup as proposed by Jed Pennington in his uh, first paper. Sorry, uh, um, then maybe can I, since this is a bit of a tangent on this higher dimensional yeah, yeah, thing, yeah. can I finish yeah. with this first and then we can yeah, come yeah, back yeah. to sure, it sure. in the discussion? Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, let me just uh, get through this, this uh, doubly holographic thing. Okay, so George Santos, who is sort of a wizard with the uh, numerical GR, he can solve this ADS5 you know, geometry. He can solve for the metric functions in the ADS5 geometry numerically and then find these minimal surfaces numerically. You see, because now this S gen has become a completely geometric quantity. There's an area in the four dimensional geometry divided by G Newton plus the S bulk, which has now become an area in the five dimensional geometry divided again by some the, the five dimensional G Newton effectively, so to speak. So, uh, okay, so that's what you have to do. And here I just want to emphasize the setup. So now I have sort of placed the wires sort of not sort of opposing each other, but like this. So, so this is the right SYK and the wire and the left SYK and the wire. And correspondingly on the right is a picture of the setup in Hartman and Maldacena. So Hartman Maldacena of course don't have any SYKs, but they just have a CFT. Right, so this is a spatial direction of, of the boundary CFT. Uh, the right CFT and the left CFT are in the thermal field double state. And Hartman and Maldacena wanted to precisely compute the entropy of a blue uh, region on the right and its sort of thermal field partner on the left. So the union of these two. Uh, okay, so now I'm just going to draw this ADS a different way. So, so these sort of SYKs uh, on this top, you know, sort of nucleate this ADS space that sort of now I drew here and these flat space wings, you know, that I just, I just drew them in a different way to sort of 
emphasize something that uh, some geometry. So again, these blue regions are whose entropy we want to compute, and H is the black hole horizon in the ADS2 description. Okay, and what happens when you have the CFD2 being holographic is that this third dimension now between these flaps and the back wall sort of gets filled in, right? That's the dimension where the ADS3 is going to fill in. So, so now here I'm tracing uh, this, this blue line and the green line and the, the point H and here. And, and the three-dimensional geometry is supposed to fill in this gap between this folded piece of cardboard. And it's in this domain that you're supposed to solve the GIJ numerically. And basically it's a five functions of two variables, some partial differential equation, which George Santos can solve with appropriate boundary conditions. Okay, so you find some geometry that fills in this and uh, sort of, yeah, two spatial dimensions and time are hidden here. So, so this is the fifth uh, dimension. Hartman and Maldacena have the same thing. So there is a spatial geometry, uh, the right and the left. This is the holographic direction and there's sort of a horizon in the middle, right? So, so I'm just emphasizing and at early times, oh, by the way, the Hartman in this setup, this sort of, this green thing is the brain, right? This is the Randall syndrome brain. We have the boundary of ADS five, boundary of ADS five. Here it's sort of an asymptotically ADS five geometry and it ends on a brain. So this is sort of the lower dimensional gravity brain. Um, okay, and at early times, the minimal surface just goes through the ADS five. It just connects this point to this point. And it's exactly like in hartmann maldacena In hartmann maldacena the surface at early times sort of connects the two things like this. But because it sort of goes through the horizon, as you increase time on both sides, forward on both sides, there is the growth of the volume in the interior of the black hole. Because of which, this sort of minimal surface starts to grow linearly in time, okay? And again, you will hit a paradox uh, if you don't do something at late enough time. Okay, so. So this is precisely the same as in hartmann maldacena And it's essentially this linear growth of the nice slices inside a black hole. Why this surface gives a contribution which is increasing linearly in time. And uh, this growth of nice slices is, is one way of understanding the growth of entropy of Hawking radiation, right? Um, okay, so here I'm just, again, trying to just draw some pictures. So the space is going to the, to the left there is time. Now I've put in time as well. So there's a left uh, CFT and a right CFT and sort of the space, the sandwich between them, uh, between the two loaves of bread is being filled in by the ADS space. And, and this yellow is the region which expands because this is a nice slice. The red line is the horizon and sort of this, the, we know that the area of this, this slice grows linearly in time. Okay, so, so this is the geometry. And again, this blue is sort of the region whose entropy we are computing. Uh, is this clear? Maybe it's worth it to pause here to, to make sure that this, this is coming across, the geometry is coming across. So time t equal to zero is at the bottom and we have moved the time forward. Sorry, so far these are just the RT surfaces, right? You're not computing at the quantum extremal surfaces. Right, but the quantum extremal surface becomes an ordinary surface in the higher dimensional, in the highest dimensional description. Right, because S bulk <laughs> itself is an area term. I see. Uh, sorry, so that, sorry. Is, that, is the, that is the trick. So you get away by, you know, just doing areas because S bulk this one loop term, which was sort of hard and non-local to compute in, in this intermediate description becomes very easy in the Randall syndrome setup because it's also just an area in a higher dimension, in a five dimensional space. I see. Um, I see. Uh, uh, so, sorry, sorry, now I'm confused. If you draw, if you, sorry, I, I, I missed this. Yeah. 
if you draw if you draw the diagram that you drew earlier where you have this brain which ends and you and you have uh, uh, you know uh, yeah yeah uh, so sorry uh, i didn't right uh, very very good so now now uh, when you have this when you compute this rt surface there are still there are still bulk propagating fields that live on that right so why don't we need to add in a contribution right right, right. but those are order one right those are like the gravitons on the brain so those are precisely sort of the order one thing. So, so now in this ADS five bulk, there is oh. no sort of large C or anything. So those contributions are sort of negative. Oh, I see. So that's why that's why you don't you don't worry about them because you. I see. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. They, they're there, but you say they, they don't matter too much because of this. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it's important to take the large C right to make it. First of all, large C is just important to have this extra holographic direction anyway. I see. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, okay. But then at late times, you see what happens is because this brain is dynamical and it has dynamical gravity, it's sort of consistent with the homology constraint to have the RT surface end on the brain. And this is indeed what happens at late times. So we have this region, you know, on the radiation region on the right and the radiation region on the left. And what happens at late times is you get the A star here. It sort of ends on the brain. So you see now the homology constraint is clear because these two points can sort of come and coalesce and move off the brain, right? And this, this surface now does not grow in time because it doesn't penetrate the horizon. So this growth of nice slices is no longer there. There's no growth of nice slices or anything and it's just a constant at late times. And it, this, uh, this blue region here will be the island here. This will be the island. So the entanglement wedge of this blue will be this whole thing, you see, and it's connected. Uh, if we just followed the boundary, if we just followed sort of this line here, uh, we would find that this island is disconnected from this, uh, this, this radiation region, but it's connected through this extra holographic di dimension. So, so this is the island that lives in the gravity region of the brain. Um, uh, okay, uh, let me stop here and emphasize again this point about rho ij and I think similar kind of ideas about UV completions uh, and the singularity resolutions will be needed to, for example, get the erratic wiggles in the spectral form factor quantity or the black hole S matrix and things like that. And I think uh, we need sort of more ideas than just uh, trying to, you know, compute areas and things like that because, uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, so thank you very much, Raghu, for the fantastic talk. So maybe we can unmute your microphone and clap up. Yeah. Yeah. So now this is the time for questions. So if you have any questions, comments, please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Uh, sorry, I, I wanted to ask a follow-up question about the uh, homology constraint. I should have asked it sooner, but my Zoom yeah. crashed. Uh, so uh, I understand your explanation through this uh, double holographic uh, situation. Yeah. But we should also be uh, able to explain this situation when the matter is not conformal, right? Uh, this this uh, uh, big picture shouldn't shouldn't depend on the matter being conformal or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. Um, well, there are a couple of answers I can I can give that. Uh, to be honest, nobody has done the calculation. So, but you know, at the level of the, uh, I mean. I believe that these explanations are robust enough that going from a CFT to QFT will not change things. And we do have holographic duals of gap CFT, gap QFTs as well. So it's not like it's only CFTs that are dual to ADS, but uh, uh, yeah, I can only say some vague things like that because it's just hard to do any concrete computations. But but you know, these kind of thermodynamic or entropic arguments usually don't care about such uh, such things. For example, uh, Andreas Karch emphasized this fact that uh, 
in these kind of brains a couple to flat space or like or this SYK coupled to a wire, you see the stress tensor of the SYK is no longer conserved, for example, right? Because it's the total stress tensor which is conserved. And the bulk statement of that is that the graviton is massive. So if you look at the Randall syndrome literature, people talked about the fact that uh, the graviton gets a mass in this Randall syndrome setup. But that kind of is also sort of a red herring as far as these entropy, entropy questions are concerned. So, so there are all these sort of minor tweaks and we have made these models sort of not like the real world, but in the end, I believe, uh, yeah, it doesn't change the answer qualitatively. I see, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, would it be possible for you to make your slides available or? Oh yeah. Oh, available, like to send it uh, some, yeah, I can send them. Yeah, sure. On, uh, and then where? I will, well, are you at ICTS, I guess? Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Okay, why don't you send me an email then I can just send okay, them. Okay, yeah, 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 that'll be great. Yeah. Okay. okay, and then uh, I do have a question. So about the thing that you're talking about that somehow, so I think you are kind of, uh, your vision is on a higher goal now to understand singularity and you're saying somehow to understand singularity you need to understand all components of the density matrix is that is that what you're trying to emphasize well, there so, sort of this is sort of a rough intuition that i have because you know the the out s out matrix the s matrix is sort of the most detailed observable you can compute in a process of black hole evaporation so I mean, if that doesn't care about the singularity, then what is going to care, right? So, I mean, in that sense, I, I believe that the singularity should leave some kind of an imprint, some very fine, hard to pick out imprint on the S matrix of a black hole. Uh, of, yeah. But that's, that's, that's the extent to which I can say. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, not the singularity, but like the precise way in which quantum gravity resolves the singularity, right? It, um, like the fuzzball idea is maybe something also to think about while we are thinking about these things. And I don't know that literature very well, and like maybe worth uh, learning about it a little more. Well, uh, I think it's some. If you do, probably you will also need to worry about because there's a uh, quantum focusing conjecture also implies somehow that you will have trapped surfaces and then you have singularity. No? Well, the quantum focusing conjecture, as far as I can tell, is a semi classical gravity statement. Like it's not, uh, it's just like a one loop kind of a thing, right? So it doesn't really tell you much about fully quantum regimes near the singularity and so on. That's true, yeah. Okay, yeah, I was just trying to pick your brain what you think of singularity, that's Yeah, it. no, I, I, I really think that, but this S matrix might be hard, but sort of this, getting these erratic oscillations on the spectral form factor is sort of maybe the, a nice goal to have at the, it, it seems too hard, but sort of, you know, as a distant goalpost, it may, it's like a good thing to have at the back of your mind. So, Radhu, uh, can I ask yes, a yes. question in this uh, direction? Singularity. Yeah, yeah, yes. What is, what is the singular, what is the signature of the uh, singularity of gravity in the dual theory? What is the signature of that? I have, yeah. say, that, that I think is an important question perhaps to Perhaps yeah, there is some and, singularity in the solution yeah, yeah. at large n at finite time, which might be yeah. reflective of. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's a good question. And it's a, it's a bit disappointing sort of that this page curve doesn't sort of probe the singularity in some sense. Yeah, yeah. Now, I do in this sort of spirit, I do want to go back to these papers of paper. Steve Schenker wrote papers about geodesics going across the black hole from the left yes. to the right that sort of probe the singularity 
Yes. And Testuccia and Liu had some papers about some asymptotics of quasi-normal modes that uh, probe the singularity in some sense. Um, but I'm not really sure uh, what the latest interpretation of those papers is because I still haven't sort of started honestly thinking about them. But I think those are the two sort of things I have in mind is this uh, Schenker uh, geodesic computations and the Festuccia Liu quasi-normal mode uh, computation. Uh, so, but yeah, and uh, well, I, I should make one more comment while we are on the subject, which is Sean Hartnell wrote some recent papers about uh, trying to get these Cosner exponents near a space like singularity. So, if we perturb the Schwarzschild singularity, the behavior of the metric gets these Cosner exponents. So, they, they take some ADS, uh, the boundary of ADS, they perturb it with some operator. I follow the geometry in the interior and near the singularity and find some kind of Kasner exponent. Now, that's a purely bulk calculation. It doesn't tell you what the interpretation is in the boundary. So it doesn't sort of directly answer your question, but at least that's some recent work that I should mention that's in the same ballpark. Uh, can I continue with my question? Yes, uh, please. Uh, okay, so. Must be getting uh, very late for you. you. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on, maybe. Okay, okay. What's, uh, so, so you were talking I, about the evaporating black hole. Uh, I just, I am mean, uh, worried about the conflict of the page curve and the constant uh, curve proposed by Subrat uh, So, uh, is it that... Oh, you're uh, talking about that. I see. Uh, okay. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. uh, Sorry, I understood the constant curve to mean the constant that I was drawing. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is it that uh, there are two different kinds of observer who are measuring the page curve and the constant uh, constant curve, meaning it's some ultraviolet observer who is uh, measuring the high point correlators. Yes, 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 yeah, exactly. So in Subrat setup, what I would say is that to, to get the tent instead of a constant, you sort of have to disentangle what you mean by the black hole and what you mean by the radiation. Sort of uh, uh, what Subrat is computing, you know, I think the precise, I, I like to think of that setup for a small black hole in ADS. Okay. So a small black hole in ADS can form and evaporate, right? But if you measure the entropy of the full boundary state on the CFT, you're just going to get zero, 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 zero for the entropy at all times, right? But clearly there is something going on in the bulk. There's a black hole that formed and evaporated. Now, what's happening is that you've sort of computed the entropy of everything you haven't divided your algebra of operators into black hole and radiation. So, okay. so you're not going to get a 10th, right? Okay. So, so, uh, so that's the difference. So, so, so I would say that the question would be to sort of say that in the small ADS black hole, if you don't couple stuff to flat space, because you know, then you don't extract anything, how do you distinguish from the boundary point of view the black hole and the radiation product, the radiation that comes out. Uh, okay, so uh, it's a conflict in the setup we are using, meaning in the factor, meaning we are, aren't assuming the Hawking radiation and the black hole to be of the same Hilbert, Hilbert space. Well, they're in the same Hilbert space, but they're like different factors or something in the Hilbert space. like. Alice and okay, Bob yeah. can be part of the yeah. same Hilbert space, but different subsystem. Okay. So, and uh, yeah. do you have any comment about uh, state dependence uh, on the page curve? No. Uh, I mean, I answered already in response to what Subrat was asking. If you take a generic enough state, there should be some small ripples on the page curve, okay. but they're small. They're not very big. Um, Uh, okay, any other questions? Uh, thank you.
I, I don't think there are no more questions. So any other questions? Yeah, I think no. So thank you very much for joining this okay. fantastic talk by Raghu. Uh, so sorry, Raghu, I think this is a bit late for you. Uh, so th no, thanks again. I usually sleep on like 1 a.m. or something. So this is, this is okay. So I still have one hour to go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Look, thank you. Okay, so, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care. Uh, hopefully, I will yeah. visit ICTS soon and I come to India. Yes, next yes, time, yes, uh, yes. When, when? Yeah. <laughs> I, after the pandemic, probably. I, I usually know. come to yeah. India in December, but yeah. uh, this time it's yeah. going to be hard to. Yeah, it's difficult actually, right? Anyway, yeah. thanks a lot for your effort. Here. Okay. Thank yeah. Bye. Yeah, thank Bye, you. everyone. Bye. See you. Bye. Thanks. Uh, can I, okay.